Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm very pleased that I can talk to you now about my favorite topic, topic namely placebo effects. As you can hear, I'm not a native English speaker, so please excuse my English from time to time. <laughs> um, but it's uh, important to practice it a little bit for me and for you. So placebo effects. I don't know what your knowledge about placebo effects is so far. Um, I will give an introductory talk and talk also a little bit about own research findings. And please feel free to ask questions at any time if something is not um, understand understandable for you. What are placebo effects? Placebo effects are effects of the therapeutic context in which uh, intervention is delivered. For example, let's take this woman here, woman here, who receives, for example, a pain injection, uh, injection against pain. And um, even if this injection does not contain any pharmacological substrate, then we would expect that this patient might perceive some relief in pain. And this is due to various factors. For example, um, we know today that treatment characteristics make a difference. And I will show you some examples later. Um, we also know that patients' characteristics make a difference, for example, treatment and illness beliefs, anxiety, or adherence to treatment. The um, practitioner's characteristics are also very important, for example, status, sex, and treatment beliefs. And also the relationship between the, the two makes a difference. Is it warm or rather neutral? And um, But we also know that the healthcare setting in which the treatment takes place can make a difference. So if the therapeutic context is positive, then a placebo effect, namely an improvement of a symptom may occur. And if the therapeutic context is negative on some, on average, then a, even a deterioration of a symptom may occur. And we call this a nocebo effect. Here, one example, which I love very much. Um, it's very nice because it shows that placebo effects do not matter only when giving a placebo, so a, um, a drug uh, or a sugar pill or something without any pharmacological substrate, but also the placebo effect modulates the effect of active treatments, for example, of painkillers. And here in this study, there were patients after surgery and they had a lot of pain. And it was important that all the patients got real treatment, but there were two groups. The one group received the treatment by a doctor who came in and said, now you will get a painkiller and you will feel better soon. And in the other group, the same painkiller was administered at the same time um, by an, um, an auto, uh, automatic infusion device from the um, room besides. And the patient got the same amount of painkiller, but the patient did not know about it. And here you can see the pain ratings over six hours and um, after the injection. And every patient got a true injection with painkillers, but the one no, knew about it and the other ones didn't. And the blue line are the patients who knew that they got a painkiller and the red line is the pain of the group who didn't know about uh, that the painkiller was administered. And here you see a big difference, which is also significant. It, this is the placebo effect related to an active drug effect, related to information given about whether a painkiller is administered or whether this information is not given. And this can also occur in the other way around. So if the doctor came in and said, oh, well, now you had a lot of hours of painkiller and we have to stop it now, and maybe the pain may increase again. And in the one group and in the other group, the doctor didn't came in, but the painkiller was stopped at the same time. And here you can see also a big difference. The blue group didn't know about stopping the painkiller and the red group didn't. And you see that the pain is only increasing in the group who expected the pain increase. And this is somehow a placebo and a nocebo effect of active drugs and of the therapeutic context. <clears throat> 
there have been performed a lot of studies in the domain of placebo research, and we can roughly differentiate between three domains. So first, a lot of studies have done in which placebo effects were analyzed within placebo-controlled clinical trials, and I will tell you some examples later. Second, very much studies have been performed to elucidate the mechanisms underlying placebo and nocebo effects. And also some studies have dealt with the therapeutic use of placebos and how can we make use of the placebo forces in clinical practice. What is a randomized placebo controlled trial? It's the gold standard to test the efficacy of new drugs or new treatments. One group typically receive uh, the test drug, so the pharmacological drug, and the other group receives an identically looking placebo drug, which does not contain any pharmacological substance. And these um, placebo and drugs are administered in a randomized and double blind fashion, which means that neither the doctors nor the patients know exactly in which group they are. And therefore, it's very important that placebos and drugs look identically and also taste identically. And then the trial is performed and afterwards, one is looking at the difference between the active treatment group, the viral group, and the placebo group, and the improvement in the both groups. And in the best case, there is a difference, and this difference reflects the active drug effect. So the aim of such a randomized placebo control trial is to demonstrate superiority of the active treatment above placebo. However, we frequently observe a lot of improvements also in the placebo groups. And here is an overview of these improvements in the placebo groups compared to the total improvements. And the, um, the gray, the, the light gray bars reflect the non-specific treatment effects which is the effect, the sum effect in the placebo groups, and the dark gray bar reflects the active treatment effect, so the specific treatment effect. And we see on the left-hand side that um, conditions like irritable bowel syndrome or depression have a large amount of non-specific effects on average. Two-thirds of the total treatment effect are due to non-specific treatment effects, and only one-third is due to specific treatment effects. And if you show it to the right-hand side, asthma and hypertonia, there the proportion is somehow the other way around. However, non-specific effects matter. And therefore, it's very important also to um, <clears throat> test whether non-pharmacological interventions also are effective above placebo. And here is one example of uh, a study in patients with pain knee. So they had osteoarthritis of the knee. And for a long time, there was a recommendation to do an arthroscopic lavage of the knee joint to um, remove the pain. And there was one, uh, and the clinical observation was that half of the patients became pain-free after the surgical intervention. However, no placebo control, control trial has been performed, and one research group did so, and um, she divided, subdivided the patients into three groups, and the first two groups received the active treatment, so um, either a lavage of the knee joint with 10 liters of saline solution, and the other group um, received, in addition, a chondroplasty, which means to remove some um, substances from the knee joint to make the joint function more smooth or smoother. And the third group just received a sham surgery. So there were done real skin incisions on the knee, but all the other surgery was fake. So for example, the surgeons did a sham lavage with Depridemol. So there were sounds of flowing water from a, a, a cassette recorder. And the, the surgeons all, also manipulated the knee joint and talked as if they were performing a true surgery. But in, um, in truth, 
They did nothing. So it was just fake. This was the placebo control group. And then they looked at the knee pain um, during two years after this intervention in the three treatment groups. And here you can see the results. And as you can see, at a first glance, after two years, there was absolutely no difference between the three groups with regard to knee pain. So no specific effect of the surgical intervention at all. Um, this was published in a very high ranked medical journal and there was a lot of skepticism about this result because none of the surgeons and orthopedics wanted to believe this result. But um, yes, I will show you some further results on sham surgery trials and it looks as if this is a very typical result. Mm -hmm. So more generally to, to sum up so far, if we run a placebo controlled clinical trial with an active treatment group, which is also called, called the VERO group and the placebo group, then the specific effect of the difference between the VERO group and the placebo group in improvement. And in the placebo group, we can observe a placebo effect. I mean um, by placebo effect, a real neurobiological effect. And there are also some other um, factors that contribute to improvements in the placebo control groups, for example, natural history of the disease, so improvement, which is naturally occurring, also statistical phenomena like regression to the mean, and also effects of possible co-interventions. And only if there is a significant specific effect, then we say that the treatment is um, effective or effic if, um, has a specific efficacy. And then also um, this treatment is paid for. So it's very important to show the superiority above placebo. But when we look at all surgical trials, uh, sorry, this will come later. <laughs> sorry. And um, here we wondered whether um, um, this um, placebo effect might be the same across all types of interventions. On the first slide, I showed you that treatment characteristics may make a difference for the ther therapeutic context and so also for the size of the placebo effect. And in the study, which I will show you right now, we looked at the sizes of placebo effects across different types of interventions to prevent migraine attacks. And we found in the literature about 80 randomized controlled trials. And we looked at the proportion of placebo responder. And a placebo responder was defined as a patient who showed at least a 50% reduction in uh, the number of migraine attacks. And there are a lot of different treatment approaches to treat migraine, for example, pharmacological drugs or also phytotherapy drugs or um, pharmacological injections or surgery or acupuncture and so on. And all these types of interventions have an adequate placebo control. For example, the oral pharmacological placebo, which is the sugar pill or also sham surgery or placebo acupuncture. And we wondered whether there might be differences in the placebo, uh, in the non-specific treatment effects across um, all the, these types of different interventions. And indeed, we found that the placebo effect, which was associated with, with sham, surgery, sham surgery and placebo acupuncture, was significantly larger than the um, improvement in response to a classical sugar pill, sugar placebo pill. So invasive placebo interventions appear to be associated with a larger placebo effect and improvement in the placebo groups compared to, to the classical sugar pill. We also run a network meta-analysis and could show that there was a significant difference between the placebo sugar pill and the no treatment group, um, but also in the network meta-analysis, um, we could show that placebo acupuncture and sham surgery were much more effective than the classical placebo sugar pill. So some placebos appear to be more effective than others. And surgery could be a very effective placebo, so a power placebo. And therefore, and now I will come to this systematic review, we looked for trials in the literature in which a surgical intervention was compared to a placebo intervention. And we found about 50 trials 
and analyzed again the non-specific treatment effect in comparison to the total treatment effect. This is uh, the non-specific treatment effect and the, in black, the specific treatment effect overall on the left-hand side and also for all pain conditions and obesity and gastroesophageal esophageal reflux disease and also for all other conditions. And we found significant differences um, um, only for obesity, GERD and other conditions, but for the pain conditions, the, there was not at all a specific a significant difference between the active surgical intervention and the placebo intervention. So, and we looked at this in more detail and could found also that for none of the sub uh, of the sub conditions within this group of chronic pain conditions, and um, there was a significant difference between the true surgery, surgery and the and and the faked surgery. And there were also some studies available for arthritis, and there was no difference between the active treatment groups and the placebo treatment groups. And the same was true for, for the trials which investigated low back pain. So surgery, at least in the field of chronic pain, appears to be as good as a placebo. However, this does not mean that surgery does not work. It could also mean that placebo effects are very large, in really, um, when a surgical intervention is done. And this has been termed the so-called efficacy paradox by Harald Wallach already in 2001. And he said, if we have two treatments, treatment one and treatment two, and treatment one is associated with a relatively small placebo effect, then the difference between the treatment and the placebo will get significant um, more easily as compared to treatment two, in which we have a large placebo effect and therefore also some kind of ceiling effect. So no more improvement is possible anymore. And um, then the difference between the treatment and the placebo might not be significant, even if, and this is the paradox, even, um, even though the patient profits more from the treatment two than from T treatment one, because his pain relief, for example, is larger by treatment two. And this is somehow a um, paradox. And therefore, it's very important to understand better the placebo effect and the factors that modulate the placebo effect in order um, to be able to, to better understand and also to better compare the results of clinical trials. And because these clinical trials are the basis for all of our um, medicine uh, in the Western medicine societies. So therefore, it's very important to better understand placebo effects. And also, it's uh, very interesting from a researcher point of view. And as I told you before, a lot of mechanistic studies have been performed to elucidate the mechanisms underlying placebo effects. And here is a slide which shows the three main mechanisms uh, or the three mechanisms um, which are very good established, but there might be much more as I show you later. So um, <clears throat> the first very important mechanism is expectation. Expectation, for example, can be induced by verbal suggestions such as you may experience a decrease in symptoms, which might lead to a placebo effect, or you may experience an increase of symptoms, and this might lead to a nocebo effect in the sense of pain increase. So verbal suggestions are very important to induce placebo effects. However, so uh, expectations can also be induced by nonverbal cues. Here are some examples from the literature, literature. For example, there was one nice study to show that four placebo pills per, per day work better than two because there is a dose response relationship, even for the placebo effect. And more elaborate placebo rituals like injections and surgery work better than less elaborate ones, as I have shown you before. And there are some more studies to show this. And, which is very nice, expensive placebos work better than cheaper ones because somehow you expect that something which uh, has a higher price works better than a pharmacological substance of a lower price. And this is shown here, though. There was a big difference in experimental pain 
between two conditions and the only difference between the two conditions was the pretended price of the intervention, which was intended to be an active drug, but in truth was only a placebo drug. In our research group in Munich, we wondered whether also the brand name of a pharmacological substance might act as a placebo. And we compared aspirin um, and a generic drug with the same pharmacological agent. Um, in this case, we used uh, aspirin and um, acetyl salicyl sulfate, I don't know in English, um, by the company 1A Pharma. And in both cases, we only administered a placebo and we experimentally induced pain um, by heat. And we could show that if the participants thought they would get an aspirin, in truth, it was only a placebo, then their pain was relieved much better as compared to the condition when they were made believe to receive only this, um, this 1A pharma. Uh, substrate, which contains in truth the same pharmacological ingredient as aspirin, but is not the brand name aspirin. And also in this group, they only received uh, placebo. And as you can see on the right hand side, the bars for the pain differ rather greatly between the two conditions. And only the aspirin group showed a significant pain reduction and not the other group. We also looked at the level of the brain and could show that this was not just a response bias or something which the, uh, the participants told us, but also we could measure significant differences at the level of brain activity. So the prefrontal cortex, which is very important for the induction of placebo effects, showed um, different activities in these two conditions. Another mechanism on which a lot of research has been done is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, also called associative learning, is learning as um, um, found by Pavlov with his famous Pavlov's dog, in which the dog um, received his food. And before the food was arriving, he, for example, heard a bell or saw a light. And then there was a conditioned response with regard to his saliva. So he salivated already before the foot was arriving because he knew to associate the red light, for example, with the arriving foot. And this was a conditioned response and could also be extinguished um, when the foot did not arrive anymore after the, the light. And um, in the early 18, um, in the 80th, 1980s, there have been done a lot of studies in animals to test whether such effects can also be conditioned with regard to drug effects. And for example, rats received an agent which alters the functions of the immune system. And this was coupled with very intensive um, stimuli, uh, such as um, olfactory stimuli or visual stimuli. And this was the learning phase. And after a while, the drug was given without the pharmacological substance, only a placebo was given. And together with the um, olfactory stimuli and the visual stimuli, and then the same reaction could be identified in the blood of the animals as compared to the true drug. And this was a conditioned placebo effect. And there have been done some trials already in humans to test whether this is also possible that humans, for example, get a real drug, but from time to time a placebo drug. And indeed, a conditioning also of pharmacological responses is possible in humans, for example, with, with regard to pain or itch or allergic rhinitis. And the third approach um, or mechanism, which is important with regard to placebo effects, is the empathy or the communication between the doctor and the patient. One study, just as an example, this was one of the first studies in this regard, which showed that patients with irritable bowel syndrome who were randomized to either a waiting list control group or to a placebo group, um, they, they further were subdivided in a group 
in which they received a placebo acupuncture together with a limited doctor-patient interaction. And in the other placebo acupuncture puncture group, the provider was very empathetic and talked a lot with the patient. And then they looked at the placebo effect after three weeks and they could show that in the waiting list control group, there was already some kind of improvement, but also in the placebo acupuncture group and the, the with and without augmented doctor-patient interaction, there was an even larger placebo effects and somehow the placebo effect increased um, with placebo acupuncture and then again with an optimized doctor-patient relationship. These are the three main mechanisms with regard to psychosocial mechanisms. Um, and there are a lot of studies which also looked at the biological mechanisms underlying placebo effects. And we know today that a lot of conditions respond to placebo interventions, for example, anxiety, depression, respiratory functions, cardiovascular functions, immune functions, gastrointestinal functions, endocrine functions, motor functions, and also pain. And I would say the most studies so far have been performed in the field of pain research. Um, pain, um, one of the first studies which showed that placebo analgesia is associated with, with specific changes in the brain uh, was done by Petrovich and colleagues, and they induced experimental pain in healthy subjects. And then they administered in a double-blind fashion either a real treatment, opiates, or a placebo. And um, here you see the brain activity in the pet um, during pain without treatment. And in 2002, this uh, was not so well known where in the brain would be activity during peripheral pain stimulation. And then here you can see what happened in the brain after giving the real drug on the left-hand side and after giving placebo. And if we split again the placebo group into the groups which showed the placebo response and the group which did not show any pain reduction, then you see there is a great uh, overlap between the activity in the placebo responders and in those who received the active drug. And the main focus is here in the prefrontal cortex. And we know from many studies that the prefrontal cortex is a very important region in which placebo effects are initiated. So this was the first study to show that endogenous opioid systems are activated by placebo treatments. And there have been a lot of other studies which could confirm it. And recently, there was uh, there has been published by some colleagues a uh, meta-analysis um, of 20 fMRI studies on placebo analgesia, and they looked um, on the average effects. And as you can see here, there were a lot of changes overall um, across the brain um, in the placebo group compared to the control group. And they did a lot of analysis and their conclusion was, we conclude that placebo treatments affect pain-related activity in multiple brain areas, which may reflect changes in nociception and other affective and decision-making processes surrounding pain. And this is also one of the um, conclusions nowadays with regard to pain placebo research, that it's not only a decrease in nociception and an increase in opioids, which are released in the brain, but also some other mechanisms play a role. For example, changes in emotions, so reductions in negative emotions in stress and anxiety, and also decision-making processes in the sense that um, our predictive brain is somehow processing the incoming signals differently when expecting an improvement in pain. And now I will also talk a little bit about the research I've done a lot um, and also some other colleagues, namely placebo effects within the gastrointestinal function uh, system. And because, uh, yes, this is, might be also an area which is of interest, especially for health psychologists, because Eating and uh, healthy food behavior is a very important topic within the field of health psychology, I think. And um, here you see a slide on the brain-gut axis. We know today that the brain 
and the gastrointestinal system is closely linked by um, neurons and, and the autonomic nervous system. And um, here I will show you studies um, with regard to gastric activity and its alteration by placebo interventions, also with regard to appetite and satiety, and lastly, with regard to nausea. My first study in this field uh, was to study placebo effects on gastric activity. And I asked 18 healthy participants, mainly students, as you, um, to come three times to the lab. And they received a placebo pill on, three, on all three days, but were told to receive on, on, on one of the days either a pill that would stimulate gastric activity, and on the other day, a pill that would relax gastric activity, and on another day, a pill which is just a placebo and would not do anything with gastric activity. And in all conditions, a placebo pill was administered in truth. And also their conditions were presented in a randomized order. And I measured subjective and objective changes of gastric activity. And here you can see the results with regard to the subjective changes. So in the group um, gastric stimulant, there reported elf um, people about the sense of gastric stimulation and seven reported no change. And in the gastric relaxant group, um, they reported eight, eight patients, some feelings as if uh, there was, uh, the stomach would be more quiet than before. And there were also some in the other groups. So not very convincing, a little bit was also significant, but more interesting is the look at the gastric activity. And I performed a so-called electrogastrogram. This is a, a, a approach where you put three electrodes above the skin, above the stomach, and you can measure and assess the gastric myoelectrical activity. It's called the gastric slow wave uh, with a frequency of three times per minute. And so our um, stomach has a very slow pacemaker activity, but you can measure it also at the skin above the stomach. And we looked at the changes before and plus, uh, after placebo administration in the three conditions and could show that there was a significant difference in gastric slow wave activity in the frequency of the gastric slow wave between the condition gastric relaxant and gastric stimulant. And the neutral condition, the placebo condition, was just in between. I omitted it here because um, otherwise um, you wouldn't see anything. And this was also significant. And this shows that the verbal suggestions even induced changes at the level of the autonomic nervous system, which also supplies gastric activity. <clears throat> With regard to appetite and satiety, um, oops, uh, there's also known today that we have two main hormones which regulate appetite and satiety, and these are leptin and ghrelin. ghrelin. And maybe you have heard about these two hormones before. They are really very established now, and we know that um, um, if we are hungry, then our ghrelin concentration in the blood, for example, goes up. And um, so we have a higher ghrelin concentration when we are hungry and we, when we are um, in a, a state of satiety, then our leptin, leptin um, <clears throat> concentrations in the blood are going up. And Alain Crum, a colleague from Stanford University, she did a very nice study in healthy participants um, with two sessions and two milkshakes and there were two conditions, one in which she said, okay, you will receive now a high cal caloric indulgent shake. Um, and in the other condition, they told the participants to receive a low caloric sensi shake, which was much more healthier, uh, healthier. And in both conditions, both in both conditions, the shakes contained the same amount of calories, for example, and it was exactly the same shake but uh, the branding again was slightly different or uh, rather um, much different. And then she looked at the ghrelin concentrations in blood before and after the meal. 
And she could show that there was a difference between the two conditions with regard to ghrelin concentration. So ghrelin concentration increased much more in the indulgent condition compared to the sensi shake condition. And this was also significant. So by expecting an indulgent shake, the ghrelin concentrations, which correlate with hunger feelings, went up much more as compared to the sensi shake condition. And we wondered whether we could also show this with regard to placebo interventions. And we um, asked whether placebo interventions could affect hunger and satiety in healthy participants. And we did a study in about 100 healthy participants who had no food allergy and had a normal um, BMI. And we allocated them randomly to one of um, five groups. And one group was just the control condition and they received a capsule and were told that the capsule wouldn't contain any active ingredient. And then we had a double blind condition in which the subjects received either a placebo to enhance hunger um, or a varone treatment to enhance or stimulate appetite. And in the third group, they received either a placebo together with the verbal suggestion that this was decrease, would decrease hunger and increase satiety. And in the Verum group, they received some agent. And the Verum group was very small, but also was used um, for that a uh, real double blind administration was possible for ethical reasons. We had also 50% males and females. And here is an example of the expectancy manipulation. So in the enhanced satiety condition, they were told you will get a capsule containing alginate or a placebo pill. Alginate will increase its volume drastically in your stomach and thus will increase satiety for at least two hours. In the control condition, you will get a capsule with no effect on hunger and satiety. And in the enhanced appetite condition, you will get a capsule containing bitters or an inert substance. Bitters are known to increase secretion of digestion digestive fluids and thus will increase appetite. And let's look at the outcome measures. Um, we um, tested hunger and satiety using visual analog scales. And we also measured plasma ghrelin concentration and also did some autonomic measurements, but I will not show the results here. There were no group differences. And the experiment was performed in the morning in the hunger state and lasted about um, one and a half hours. And the results, first the treatment guess, did you receive the active treatment or the placebo treatment? And here we saw that the, in the enhanced appetite group, some more people believed to re have received a placebo as compared to the enhanced satiety group. So the enhanced satiety group might have been a little bit more credible to the participants. And what about satiety and hunger, hunger ratings? Here we also saw that the satiety intervention um, increased satiety. And in the enhanced appetite group, the satiety was decreased, but not um, significantly. And also the hunger ratings showed the same pattern. So hunger decreased in the enhanced satiety group and decreased a little bit in the enhanced appetite group. Um, so at the behavioral level, there was an effect only in the enhanced satiety group. But when we look at the ghrelin level, uh, at the ghrelin measures, then we see a difference in the other condition, namely in the enhanced appetite group. However, only in the female participants. So the female participants showed an increase in ghrelin levels in the enhanced appetite group, whereas the males did not show any group differences with regard to ghrelin levels. And the last study I will show you is about nausea. And we did a lot of studies to test um, the mechanisms underlying placebo effects in nausea. Um, here I will show you uh, the, the design of the study. So healthy participants came to our lab on day one and day two, and on both days, Nausea was induced for 20 minutes, and then they were randomly allocated to a placebo control group, a placebo group or a control group, which did not receive any treatment. 
And the placebo intervention was performed by a tense device by which we stimulated a um, placebo acupuncture point. And we also had two further conditions in the placebo group, one with tactile stimulation and one without to test whether there would be some difference between the placebo effects if we have a more intense and a less intense placebo intervention. This was, uh, uh, every session lasted about one hour and we performed the placebo interventions even before we started the vection drum to induce nausea. And here you can get an impression of the vection stimulus. So for 20 minutes, the patients saw this vection stimulus um, in front of them, 30 centimeters in front of them. And they developed a lot of, no a lot of nausea, which was intended. So on a scale from zero to 10, they developed on average in the second 10 minutes of this experiment about uh, um, 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 a rating of five, an average rating of five on the untreated day and also in the untreated group. But when they received the placebo treatment, the nausea, nausea ratings were, were um, almost half as high as before. So this is the placebo effect. And we did now three studies with the same paradigm and could show that uh, this is really reliable. So a placebo effect on nausea really exists. Here you see the nausea ratings on day one and on day two, there was a big reduction. However, we could not observe any difference between the two placebo conditions. And therefore in the following, these two placebo conditions are merged. We also looked at the electrogastrogram, which I showed you before. And the electrogastrogram is known, um, a certain parameter is known to decrease during nausea. And we could also show this during nausea stimulation. And this decrease was counteracted by the placebo intervention, however, only in females. Then we also looked at the level of the brain and did an EEG analysis and also looked at a parameter which is known to reflect the intensity of nausea at the level of the brain. And here we saw the same pattern. So we could observe a reduction of the nausea-induced change in, a, um, in brain activity. However, again, only in females. So somehow there appear to be differences between males and females with regard to physiological res placebo responses. However, the behavioral placebo response may it be with regard to nausea or also appetite and satiety is always the same across sexes. We just have a difference in physiological patterns. And this could also be observed in other studies as well. We also looked at the level of the proteins in the blood, and I will only very shortly show you the results. So um, we took blood probes several times during the experiment and could identify about 700 proteins in the blood and did so-called proteomic analysis um, to, to see whether any proteins would be associated with the placebo response. And indeed, we found 74 proteins, which somehow showed a relationship with the placebo response. And one very interesting result was that the acute phase response, um, which we show when we are sick, um, was somehow related to the placebo effect in nausea. And another very nice result was that we found that some social neuropeptides, which are known to be associated with grooming behavior, um, um, is associated with the placebo effect in nausea. So grooming behavior, you can see here on the left hand upper side, is a behavior in which animals care for each other. For example, when one animal feels sick and the grooming behavior has for a long time been speculated to be the evol evolutionary root of the placebo effects. And therefore, it's very interesting that we could find that um, there was a link between protein changes in the blood during the placebo effect in nausea and proteins that are related to grooming behavior. And um, the hypothesis is that the animals who care for each other, and um, this was followed up by shamanic rituals, caring for each other when one of the group is sick and 
this is also continued nowadays when the doctors and the um, um, other healthcare professionals care for a patient. And this also appears to be an important component of the placebo response, as I told you before. Here's almost my last slide, because this is what's going on in the moment, very actively within the placebo research group, international placebo research group, because um, it was found first by Ted Kapchuk from Harvard University, that it might be possible to induce a placebo effect even when telling the patients to receive a placebo. This is called an open label placebo. And this is very interesting because if you want to use a placebo effect in clinical practice, then usually the doctors does not tell her patients to receive a placebo or to get a placebo. They just tell you receive a treatment which is known to be effective. And somehow they have to um, lie about the true nature of the placebo. And therefore, it's very interesting to see for the use in practice if even an open label placebo can have an effect. And this is the first study which has been done in this field by Ted Kapchuk, as I told you before, in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And they were randomly allocated to either a no treatment group or an open label placebo group. And then for three weeks, they took an open label placebo. So they knew that they took a placebo, but they were also somehow educated about the placebo effect and were told that the placebo effect is a real phenomenon, a neurobiological phenomenon, that it's important to take the placebo strictly two times per day. And it's that it's not that important to believe in the placebo. It's more important to take the placebo regularly. And this was done by the patients for three weeks. And thereafter, what happened with the symptoms of the irritable bowel syndrome? And indeed, there was a significant difference between the two groups. The improvement was much higher in the open placebo group compared to the no treatment control group. And this was a very nice study and followed up by much experiments all over the world. And we, all, we have also done one of um, the follow-up studies in patients with chronic knee pain and could also confirm that open label placebos can reduce pain in elderly patients. And here's a meta-analysis before our study has been published of 11 trials, uh, 11 trials in different conditions, including back pain, cancer-related fatigue, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, allergic rhinitis, major depression, irritable bowel syndrome, and menopausal hot flushes. flushes. Um, and you see that the meta-analysis shows clearly a beneficial effect of open-label placebo above no treatment. And the effect size is moderate to large, and the positive effect of open-label placebos are very consistent, as I think, um, as you can see here in this slide, very consistent across different conditions. And this is a very promising result. And as I told you before, a lot of study and placebo research groups are performing studies on open label placebo treatments. And there are also studies that look at the mechanisms um, underlying open label placebo effects. And this is where a lot of activities go along nowadays within the research field of, open, uh, of placebo research. So I thank you very much for the attention. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to respond to them. And if you may have any questions later, you can also write me an email. Here is my email address. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Karen, for this very interesting talk. I've learned a lot of new things and I have thousands of questions, actually. <laughs> um, I've seen that there are two um, questions already in the chat, so I will just uh, start with them. And um, so Benjamin asked, um, and I think this has been sort of answered, but I'm just going to ask it again. Are there any studies of interactive effects between placebo effects of drugs in comparison to only placebo control groups? This is a very good question. And um, indeed, some people suspect that there might be an interaction. So because um, if we look at the gold standard, the placebo controlled clinical trial, then we always assume that this is an additive effect. So we, we have the placebo effect and then on top, 
the active treatment effect. And indeed, it might be the case that there is an interaction and there are some studies which point in this direction, but I think a definite answer cannot be given yet. Okay. Um, then Hannah also asked a very interesting uh, question, I think. Can placebo effects only occur if the patient is able to understand that he or she is receiving a placebo or not treatment? So no placebo effects in sedated patients, newborns, or people with dementia? Or does that also exist? Yes, also a very interesting question. Um, there is a nice study which showed that patients with developing dementia which showed a placebo effect in one year um, did not show any more a placebo effect in the next year when their brain in the prefrontal areas were damaged as compared to the first year. So, and we also know from another type of study in which um, you block the activity of the prefrontal cortex by st external stimulation. And there you can also show that the placebo effect can be blocked if the prefrontal cortex is not working anymore. And so I think the study in the patients with dementia could answer your question. So actually that's a follow up on my side then. Um, at what age do we actually develop um, the ability to have placebo effects if that's connected to your prefrontal cortex as well? Yes, um, this depends a little bit on the um, approach how to induce a placebo effect. So we know that a conditioned placebo effect can even be induced in newborns. Okay. But it's conditioned and um, and a placebo effect by expectation, this starts about, yes, if, if the prefrontal cortex is enough developed, I would say, so in the early school years, yes. Okay, um, last question from the audience and then I will ask one of my questions because I want to get the answer as well. Does placebo effect exist in case of animals? So basically, do animals also have placebo effects? Can we? Are there any studies about this? Yes, um, again, um, in animals, we can observe placebo effects, but only those which are induced by conditioning and also those which are induced by the relationship between the owner of the animal and the animal itself. So this is called placebo by proxy. So this is not proven yet, but this is a hypothesis in the literature. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, in interest of time, I'm just gonna ask one of my questions. And so you talked about um, placebo uh, responders and uh, also some gender differences. So I was just wondering like who, who are the people who would or who, are more inclined to respond to placebos and what are gender differences or cultural differences in this regard? There's been done a lot of research um, into this question and there are no personality differences so far uh, have been found between placebo responders and non-responders and also demographic variables don't matter so much with regard to the behavioral placebo effect level. So at the physiological level, there might be differences, but this is also not yet so consistent. Um, no, we don't have the typical placebo responder. Some studies show some genetic differences between people who more or less respond to placebo, um, but the differences are very small as compared to the contextual influences in which a patient responds to placebo or not. So I would say we all are equipped from the evolution to, 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 to show a placebo effect, but it depends on the situation mostly. Okay. Um, maybe we end with a sort of ethical or philosophical question. So if, if the effects are so strong and big, um, I mean, would, would you think it makes sense to just, um, when, you know, to encourage um, um, doctors to just use the placebo effect, effect in, in certain instances? Is that ethical in your opinion? It could be, but I think the doctors wouldn't be so um, happy to do so <laughs> because uh, um, they would like to treat specifically and this is their um, their aim. Um, but what the placebo researchers uh, try in the moment is, for example, to give a placebo in addition to an active drug to harness the placebo effect, mm -hmm. especially. And, and this is, I think, is more uh, realistic to be practiced in the future 
to give both an active drug, for example, and a placebo drug knowingly, so an open label placebo. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for this very interesting talk. Um, the students and everyone uh, who's attending got your email address in case they have more questions. So every one of you also thanks for attending. And uh, the next talk will be at the end of November. So maybe we see each other then. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Bye bye. <laughs>